Hello. I started it, another video and it cut off suddenly. And I don't know if that's going to post to the group or not. <sighs> and that sucks. So I want to tell you that I want Buddhism to be something that everyone feels like they can practice. And with that being said, I want Buddhism to be something that Christians feel like they can get a benefit from, that atheists who are really against religion feel like they can get a benefit from, that pagans can get a benefit, everyone can get a benefit from. And I think Buddhism can be that, but sometimes it's not that, or sometimes we're afraid it's not that. So I had some friends who wanted to go to a Buddhist temple and kind of experience that, have that experience, but then they ultimately they were afraid to do it because they were afraid that it would be against against what they believed in. And I think that people experience that fear, especially. So learning about Buddhism, reading books, studying, joining groups, watching videos like this one, that's one thing. And of course, going to a place where there are Buddhists and or even just meditators, maybe secular meditation even, going to a place, that's something different, right? And certainly calling yourself a Buddhist, that's something different. So I think that people can be very nervous and, and I don't like that. And I want to reach those people. I want to reach the, the atheist who thinks that, that, religion is bad and that Buddhism is a religion and therefore it's scary and bad. Scary is not the right word. That's really insulting for me to say that. But I also want to reach the Christian who is afraid that this Buddhist practice takes us away from the teachings of Christ because I don't agree that it does. I, and I will tell you just for a moment about myself. I, um, okay. I grew up in a household where my parents, we went to church sometimes, but in my house, we never talk about religion or politics ever, ever, not once. And I didn't realize till I was an adult that that is a very rare way to grow up. So we went to church sometimes, not every week, but um, enough that I remember it pretty well, but we didn't talk about religion in my house. And I certainly identified as a Christian throughout childhood. And actually in high school, I started to think about getting, I started to read the Bible and I started to really reflect and try to get really deeply into it sort of on my own. But um, one day when I was 19, I just suddenly thought, I don't, I don't believe anymore. Just suddenly out of nowhere, not, I mean, I should reflect on that some. I was going to say nothing happened, but that is the year my mom died, so who knows. But I just I just suddenly, one day I had faith in the divinity of Christ, and the next day I didn't anymore, and it was gone. And for a little while in my 20s, I really was mad. And I was one of those angry folks that just thinks that Christianity is horrible, and it's ruining the world. And... I'm really glad I grew out of that because that was not a way to be. That was not a happy way to be. And I'm really thankful that I grew out of that because I was kind of holding on to that. Like, like I'm mad that we just accept this. That was kind of how I felt. I thought, why is our culture? Why is this normal? Right. And I really softened as the years went on. And First, I became a Buddhist, and I am a Buddhist, and then I started to kind of just think, well, I mean, Christianity is not for me, but that doesn't mean it's bad, right? I think, and I think I want to say, also, life is really hard. Life is really hard. As, I mean, as a Buddhist, that's one of the central teachings I, I learned, I have, I think about, is life is suffering, right? Life is really hard, and I think that Whatever your religion is, if it helps you, I think that's good because life is really hard and we all need something. So in that sense, I think 
I think if somebody thinks that reading the Bible is really helpful to them or thinking about the Lord shining a light on them or whatever else, whatever other thing people think, whatever other thing people think, whatever other things people believe, I think that that is a net good. That is a good thing. If it makes your life easier, it's good. If it makes you happier, it's good. And if it makes you nicer to other people, it's good. I think that if you're practice, practicing a religion and you try to think of why you're doing it or how it makes you a better person and you can't, then I think you need to spend some time reflecting. That's that's the difference. I think that many, many people just never reflect and they never think about it. And I think reflecting on your beliefs is good. So thinking about why do I believe this? What do I believe? How do my beliefs make me a better person? How do my beliefs help me get through hard times? I think thinking about those things is good. And because if your beliefs don't make your life better, they don't make you more virtuous, they don't make you more able to weather the storms of life, then you need to examine sort of, am I just doing this because I was told to do this? Or am I really in this? And I think, so in that sense, I think, I really like Christians that study the Bible really deeply because I think that's a very different thing than just listening to sermons and doing what you're told and believing what you, what you're told. I think that's very important. So in that sense, I'm going to say that that's a good thing. Examining your beliefs is always a good thing. Saying, why do I believe this is always helpful, but whatever your religion is, I think that, if it helps you get through life, it's a good thing. Life is really hard to get through. And I think that maybe when we're really young, we don't know that. But as we get older, we see how much of a struggle life is. And I would not begrudge someone for using this or that to deal with how bad life is. I hope that what you don't use is doing drugs all the time and getting drunk all the time. That's what I hope you don't use to get through life. But um, that's what some people do, right? Um, so anyway, I have gone to pagan festivals where I taught pagans about Buddhism and paganism is a unique, sort of a unique religion because at least, at least the ones I met, I don't want to generalize because I know some pagans are not like this, but the ones I met, they think you can just take things from other spiritual traditions. And a lot of them worship, worship Buddha, which I don't, but a lot of pagans do worship Buddha. And I think um, that was a very unique experience. So I think Buddhism slides into paganism really easily. But how does Buddhism work with... I'll talk about atheism first, because that's easier. Buddhism is a way of working with your mind. Um, there are some branches of Buddhism where they believe supernatural things, things that that atheists, that secular people are going to struggle with, like spirits and reincarnation and things like that. But those aren't fundamental to Buddhism. What is fundamental to Buddhism is life is suffering. The cause of suffering is attachment. There's a way out of suffering. The way out or the way to live the most contented life is to cultivate virtue, concentration, and wisdom. Virtue, concentration, and wisdom. I'm going to read this comment. David says, and be cautious if your religion leads to hatred in your life. I 100% agree with that. I think that if you hate anyone because of your religion, you need to think long and hard about that. Because if your religion leads you to hate people, I question, I question how much it's helping you because hatred does not help you. I 100% believe hatred does not help you. And I think that, I think that there is a reason why Jesus said we shouldn't hate people and the Buddha said we shouldn't hate people and Lao Tzu said we shouldn't hate people and Krishna said we shouldn't hate people. I think there's a reason why this is a feature in all Religion, because hatred makes us unhappy. Makes us unhappy. I'm not saying that if somebody's a jerk, you let them walk all over you, but I am saying if you're holding hatred in your heart, 
you're letting a person who's a jerk affect you in a negative way. When you hate someone, you're giving them power. You're giving them power to make you hate them. And that's no good. That's not good for you. And it's not good for them. So that's a thing that we hold on to it like this. That was just my hatred tangent. Um, I really want to thank you for that comment, David, because that's, that's really insightful. Religion does lead to hate sometimes. Um, I live in Kansas City, Missouri. Um, and I think people all over know about the Westboro Baptist Church, which is in Topeka, Kansas. It's like an hour or so away from me. But that is these, these, this family who, I guess they believe that um, acceptance of gay people has, is ruining civilization. That's what they believe. They believe gays are going to hell and we should all just practice hate. We should all just be telling gay people how much we hate them. And they go with these signs that say really nasty things about gay people. And they even say like, I remember I saw once that one that said, thank God for 9-11. And that really floored me because they thought that 9-11 was something the Lord sent to the earth to punish America for accepting gay people too much. Um, and gosh, I just want to say, I don't think any of my gay friends feels too accepted, but, um, and also like other places accept gay people a lot more and they don't get hit by 9-11s, but that is hate, right? The Phelps family, the Westboro Baptist Church, that is, that is, their religion is leading them to hatred, and they could be asking questions about that. They could be reflecting on the message of Christ and thinking, "Is this, is this really how I want to live?" And I don't, I don't know. Uh, some of them, plenty of people have left that church actually. Um, and that's all I have to say about that, I guess. But anyway, love is a virtue. I don't think hate is a virtue. So anyway. Uh, moving on, I want to tell you about a podcast I listened to um, by a minister, a former minister named Rob Bell. He has a podcast called The Robcast. Rob Bell, former really, he's still a minister, but he doesn't have a congregation. He does a podcast, and he does live shows. I'm going to go see him, actually, in February. I'm pretty excited about that. But anyway, I started listening to him, even though it's a Christian podcast, and I think that he he says things like the message of Jesus is for everybody. It's not for Christians. It's for everyone. And like God is, is love and we should all be loving each other and taking care of each other. And he really has, has made me look at Christianity and Christian teachings in kind of a, uh, a more enlightened way. But also this Rob Bell, this minister is a meditator. Well, at least I don't want to call him a meditator, but he sounds like a meditator. He talks about just being here, being fully present in this moment, being aware of the world around you. Um, and he talks about things like the wonder of the world around us. If we can just pay attention, the world is a wondrous place. And I, I believe the world is a wondrous place if we just pay attention too. I think that we live our lives on autopilot a lot of times and we aren't seeing the world around us and we aren't having meaningful connections with the people around us. And I think meaningful connections are really important. So anyway, I'm telling you about Rob Bell because since I started listening to this podcast in many ways, it has influenced the way I give talks like this one. So I can say I have learned, I have learned from Christian a Christian speaker. I have learned um, how to connect with people better from listening to Rob Bell's podcast because he's really good, but he teaches mindfulness and he's a Christian and he teaches that we should all care about each other and love each other. So anyway, I'm just telling you about him because I really like him and I want you to get the Rob cast and you should, if you listen to podcasts, but, um, so where are we? So Buddhism, we're cultivating Virtue, concentration, and wisdom, okay? So, Buddhist virtue. What is Buddhist virtue? That is creating harmony 
between ourselves and the world around us. Creating harmony between ourselves and the world around us. So when the Buddha said that we shouldn't be killing and lying and stealing, he said those things not because those things are ethically wrong, although they are. He said those things because those things create disharmony. We fuck up our lives a lot when we lie. We fuck up our lives a lot when we steal and when we kill. And when we're doing these things, it makes it hard to be more fully present. It makes it hard to be more aware in our lives. It makes it hard to build meaningful connections with people. And since those are the things we want to do, we want to do whatever we can to not put roadblocks in our way. I know there's a famous quote, and I don't know who said it, but a famous person said, when you tell the truth, you don't have to remember what you said. So when we do right, when we lie, then we can easily lose track of which lie we've told, how much we've lied, what we've told to this person, what we've told to that person. And when we tell the truth, we're not caught up in that. When we're not stealing, we're not worried about getting caught stealing. And we really also want to come from a place of compassion. And that's another aspect of virtue. We want to come from a place of compassion because compassion makes us happy. It brings happiness to our lives. We can see others being successful and be happy about that. We can think of humanity as a, as a brotherhood. I wanted to think of a gender neutral thing to think of saying I could. A brotherhood and a sisterhood of people. We're all in this together. And like I said, life is really hard and we can take care of each other and we can make life better if we think in that way. If we think everyone is fighting a hard battle. Everyone is struggling all the time. Well, maybe not all the time, but everyone's struggling a lot. We're all getting older. We're all getting tired. We're all getting slower. We're all getting sick. We're all seeing people we care about suffer. We're all seeing people we care about die. Um, the poet Charles Bukowski said, we're all going to die, all of us. What a circus. You would think that would make us love each other, but it doesn't. We are eaten up by trivialities and torn apart by nothing. We're all going to die, all of us. You would think that would make us love each other. And that's what I think about when I think about compassion. I think about that. Why can't we just be nicer? Why can't we just think about how to help the people around us? And that's some of what I think about when I think about virtue. And I said all that because compassion is a big part of the message of Christ. Right, So if we're thinking about Buddhism and Christianity, we can think hard about compassion. And all that love your neighbor, right? Jesus didn't say, be nice to your neighbor. He didn't say, don't be a jerk. He didn't say, well, I mean, he probably did say those things, but he said, love your neighbor. He said, love your neighbor as yourself. How big of an asshole can you be to someone if you really love them as yourself? If you really are trying to do that, can't be that big of an asshole to them, right? So that's why love your neighbor as yourself is a powerful message. It's a powerful message. And it's really easy to put on a bumper sticker and it's really easy to say and it's really hard to do. And that is essentially when I'm talking about Buddhist compassion, that's what I'm talking about too. It's, I'm talking about loving your neighbor as yourself. That is so important because if we practiced that, we would have a really nice world. And not to say that it's easy because it's not. We are going to forget a lot to do it. But that's why we want to learn how to cultivate a little bit of space in our minds so that we can maybe not be so reactive so we can have a second to think, am I reacting in a loving way to this thing that's happening? Could I be more loving right now? 
Because if we can act, ask ourselves that, if we have time to ask ourselves that before we act, then we can do a lot better. We can create a whole lot more harmony. And that's what I really want to see us do. And I think we live in a world of very quick reactions to things. I can just look at how often I let myself get into arguments with people on Facebook. I should never do that, not once, but I do it. And I'm not... Are we coming from a place of compassion when we're arguing with people on Facebook? Certainly not. So, anyway. Virtue, as it's presented in Buddhism, is not far away from virtue as it's presented in I think that a Christian trying to practice Buddhism can definitely get into the virtue teachings because they're they're not dissimilar. Especially if your focus is on the things Jesus said rather than on any of the extraneous material because he for the most part said some really nice things and um, I'm going to take a moment here to just talk about um, there are people that say that Jesus um, traveled to India and Tibet and learned Buddhism and brought that back and made it his ministry. That is made up. That is not true. That was a hoax and that was revealed as a hoax a long time ago, but people for whatever reason, they really like to think about that. But that's not true. But what is true is that there were Buddhists in the Roman Empire practicing and teaching at the time of Jesus. We don't think about that. We don't think about how big the Roman Empire was and how the Romans, people from all over were in the Roman Empire. But there were Buddhists in the Roman Empire at the time of Jesus. That doesn't prove anything. Maybe he heard about Buddhism. Maybe he didn't. But I think... I think these teachings are fundamental truths about the human experience. So, what do I mean by that? I mean, if Jesus said something similar to what Buddha said, like turn the other cheek, that's very similar to something Buddha said. And if Lao Tzu said something similar to what Buddha said, something similar to what the Buddha said, and if the Bhagavad Gita has really similar things to what the Buddha said, That's because we're looking for fundamental truths about human existence and we're finding them. That is not necessarily because these people all interacted and stole things from each other or, or borrowed things from each other. It's because living a compassionate life is good for us. Being kind to others is good. And it, I think that's why even there's a movement in modern... Uh, non-religion, I'm just going to say non-religion, called secular humanism, where they say, you know, we don't believe in magic and spirits and gods, but we do say you should just be nice to people, right? They can come to that conclusion too, even though they're not, you know, they're not thinking about Christ. They're not thinking about what Buddha said. They're just thinking, man, we're going to have a better world if we're nice to each other. And for the most part, it feels good to let go of our anger. It feels good to be kind for the most part. So anyway, I talk a lot about cultivating virtue. And I want to talk, I still want to talk about cultivating concentration and wisdom. So concentration. That is when we are trying to learn how to focus, how to um, point our minds where we want to point them. So, for example, I had trouble sleeping last night because I was worried about a uh, political matter. And I had some trouble sleeping last night because I was worried about With my training and concentration, I want to gain the skill to not worry about that, to direct my mind at what I want to do, which is go to sleep. And I think we all can relate to the experience of not being able to sleep because we are worried about something that we can have no impact on right now, but we're still worried about it, right? 
we can all relate to that experience, I think. And it sucks. And I think we can also all relate to the experience of we're trying to pay attention to something and there are lots of distractions around that are pulling our attention, right? That's what we're talking about when we talk about training and concentration. Getting better at focusing. I can't imagine someone, someone having a religious argument against that. And I think of, and there's a, I'm going to say another quote from Jesus. Jesus said, be still, Some, something, I'm probably misquoting, something along the lines of, be still and know that I'm with you. Something like that. Did Jesus say that? That's in the Bible. I'm certain it's in the Bible. I'm not certain Jesus said it, but it's just be still and know that I'm with you. And that's what I think of when I think of concentration. I think of stillness, the ability to just be still, to be present, to notice what's around me and to pay attention to what's around me. I especially think about that um, in regards to concentra- uh, conversation, concentration, conversation. I think about that in regards to being able to talk to another person and really pay attention to them and really listen to them. I think we live in the world now where there are lots of so that you're not really listening. And also you're not, sometimes we're not listening because we're waiting to talk. We're waiting for the thing we want to say. And often that's not good. And it's really refreshing when you talk to someone and they really give you their full attention. It's really refreshing because we don't have a lot of that these days. And um, it also feels very good to give someone my full attention because when I'm giving them my full attention, I'm really noticing what they're trying to say and I'm really noticing how they feel. And I'm really understanding the person I'm talking to a lot better. And we could all do with understanding the people we're talking to a lot better, I think. So listening is very, very powerful. And that's a part of concentration, really. Just giving someone your full attention because I think everyone around you deserves your full attention. That might be controversial, but I think that when you're talking to someone, they deserve your full attention. Especially, I mean, someone you're in a relationship with and your kids, especially your kids. Um, I worry that kids internalize a lot of that if their parents aren't paying close attention to them. And attention really makes people feel loved. And we all need to feel loved. And we're all sad when we don't feel loved. And we can carry a lot of baggage around that. We can carry a lot of baggage around that. And lastly, I will talk about the cultivation of wisdom. Okay, so again, Buddhism is nothing but the cultivation of virtue, concentration, and wisdom. And now I'm going to talk about wisdom. And it's said that uh, this is like a table. This is like a table with three legs. If any of these three legs are gone, your table's not going to work very well. Okay, like a table with three legs. If any of these three legs are gone, your table's not going to work very well. So we're talking about, with Buddhism, we're talking about living to our full potential, our full potential to be content, to have a healthy relationship with the world around us, to live a harmonious life, to pay attention to the things we want to pay attention to, I think that when your attention is fragmented, when you are not seeing the world clearly, when you're pulled around by this and that distraction, and when you are not living in harmony with the world around you, then it's really easy for people to sell you stuff or to trick and deceive you or to manipulate you. That's all very easy if you're not fully engaged in your world. 
And I think we need to think about that too. When you have fragmented attention, it's really easy to sell you stuff. So lastly, I'm going to talk about wisdom. And this might be the hardest. I don't think it should be hard, but this might be the hardest one for people of other religions to come into. Wisdom. When we talk about wisdom, we are talking about understanding the world and our place in it. And seeing things clearly. What do I mean by seeing things clearly? What I mean is we bring a lot of baggage into every experience. Some, some people say we bring our whole life into every experience. And I think there's a lot of truth to that. We experience the world. I like to think of those old fashioned um, 3D glasses. Do you know the kind? They're like one eye's red and one eye's blue. Um, that's what they had when I was little. I'm dating myself, but they don't have those anymore, I think. But that's how we see the world a lot of the time, through a filter. So we don't see the world as it really is. We see it through that filter. We are seeing red and blue shades to everything instead of seeing everything as it really is. And that's because we have a lot of baggage we're carrying around. And that's not to say we shouldn't learn from our past because we really should. But we should not live there. And we should also, it's not the same as baggage, but we also should not live in the future. So we shouldn't be carrying what we're thinking is going to happen with us so tightly either. And that's not to say, again, that we shouldn't plan, that we shouldn't try to make our life better. It's just saying that we shouldn't obsess with the future because that can take us away from here. And here is where we are. We are not in the past and we are not in the future. We are here. So what does seeing the world clearly mean? It means... Seeing that we're part of humanity. We are part of humanity and we're not that different. We're not that different. We're all going through the same, many of the same struggles. Of course, some people have different struggles than I do and I have different struggles than you do, but we're all going through some of the same struggles. We're all experiencing impermanence, right? We're all getting, look at the gray in my beard. We're all getting older. We're all getting sick. I have found that um, I'm 39 years old. I have found that as I go deeper into middle age, uh, when I get sick, it sure lasts longer than it used to, man. I had a cold for a, I had, I had a cough for a month. That sucked. And that's impermanence. That is learning as we get older, our illnesses are going to last longer and they're going to get more unpleasant. And we're all going through this. Even, um, super wealthy people who maybe don't have a lot of the struggles I have, they still have that one. And that's not going to go away for them. The most meaningful, many of the most meaningful struggles we have are ones that we all have. And we can think about that. We can think about, about ourselves as part of a whole. And the truth is we are part of a whole because everything we do is touched by another person. So we don't do anything on our own. So right now I'm in front of a computer. Somebody built that. Actually, probably a bunch of people built that, right? And I'm using an internet service called Google Fiber. Somebody installed that, somebody invented that, somebody installed that. I don't know how the internet works, but somebody made that, right? And that's coming to you and somebody invented Facebook and a lot of people make Facebook happen and that's where this is happening. And people set up this group and really everything that has brought people into this group has led up to this video, right? I'm connected in so many ways just from this video I'm making to everyone watching it and everyone that laid the ground for it to happen and for it to come to you. And you're watching it and you're influencing me because I'm seeing you watch it. It's telling me how many people are watching and stuff like that. And then that's influencing me. And earlier I addressed David's comment, which was awesome. So we are interconnected with other people in so many ways um, and with the world around us. And 
I'll tell you an analogy that Thich Nhat Han made, the Zen teacher Thich Nhat Han, he made this analogy, and this goes analogy, where he pointed to a piece of paper and he said, think about that. You're going to, I'm paraphrasing because I don't know exactly what he said. I'm actually doing this without notes. Are you proud of me? And he said, this piece of paper, um, let's see, the sunshine shines down on this plant, right? And there was rain and it watered this plant and this plant grew and somebody took this plant and did the process of turning it into paper, right? Yeah, I don't, I don't know enough about paper to know what that process is, but they took what came from that cloud and that rain and they did the process of turning this into paper and they took this paper and they took it to someone else who put ink in it, right? If, if we're reading something, they put ink in it. And then if you're reading it, somebody taught you how to read, somebody invented that language and taught you how to read and taught you how to speak so that you would have a context for being able to read. So the earth and the sun and the rain and the person who cut down that tree and the person who turned it into paper and the person who put the ink in there and the people who taught you how to read and the people who taught you the, the English language, all these things went into this, just a piece of paper. And it's all tied together. And that's how the world is. We are connected to everything around us in many ways. We didn't we say that we came into the world. Sometimes we talk that way, but we didn't come into the world. We came out of the world. We came out of the world and we're part of the world. And that is a fundamental teaching of Buddhism. And that's what we're talking about when we're talking about wisdom. We're talking about seeing how connected we are, how we think we're separate, but we're not. We're connected to everything around us in so many ways. You are not a separate being. You are a being that is part of a whole. And does Christian teaching have a problem with that? I don't think so. And I'll tell you why. Because Jesus said, the kingdom of heaven is within you. The kingdom of heaven is within you. And I think that when he said that, he was coming to the same point. He was saying, we can turn our attention inward and we can see the truth is all around you. And the truth is you. And it's all the same. And we're all one. And I don't think there's a conflict between that and Christian teaching. Some people think there is. I don't think there is. So if you're a Christian and you're thinking about practicing Buddhism, studying Buddhism, learning about Buddhism, hanging out with Buddhists, I hope you will do it. I hope you will do it. And at the same time, if you go to a Buddhist temple and there's weird stuff going on and you're uncomfortable, you can leave and go to a different one too. You don't need to be scared off by that. And you could certainly leave and just come here and just talk to me about Buddhism. And that's okay too. And it's really just cultivating virtue, concentration, and wisdom. And I think that is what a lot of religion is about. So I think we can bring these th things together. I think we can bring these things together very easily. Um, so with that, I've been talking for a long time and I'm going to end this video now. I want to thank you for watching and I want to recommend two books and I'll put these in the comments, but I recommend Buddhism for Non-Buddhists by Janet Taylor, Buddhism for Non-Buddhists by Janet Taylor and Living Buddha, Living Christ by Thich Nhat Hanh. Living Buddha, Living Christ by Thich Nhat Hanh. I recommend both of those books if you're interested in these issues that I've been talking about here. If you have any questions, please Put them in the comments. I will answer any question that is asked. Thank you. Have a good day.